Yuma, Darawa Nuna, Darawa Nunawal, Yungu Nalawiri Duni Manyun, Nunawal Wiri, Darawa Wiri. Hello, this is Nunawal Country, and today we're gathering, virtually at least, from Nunawal Country. I greet you in the language of deep time in this place, and I acknowledge the Nunawal and Ngambri peoples as the traditional custodians and owners of the land around our nation's capital in Canberra. And we pay our respects to your elders and ancestors, the knowledge makers, knowledge keepers and knowledge sharers through the vastness of time on this continent. Because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians are the nation's first STEM practitioners uh, and knowledge makers through a vastness of time that is almost unfathomable, uh, really hard to get our heads around. I'm Misha Schubert and it's my very great honour to be the CEO of Science and Technology Australia and to welcome you to this very special event today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, today we gather virtually to officially launch our nationwide search for the next constellation of superstars of STEM. And what an exciting moment this is. We will be recording today's event so we can catch up later. Uh, and we're really grateful to each of you for making the time in a busy week to be with us. As many of you know, three years ago, we started, we created the Superstars of STEM program to smash gender stereotypes in STEM, in both study and careers. And this program was born from a couple of key insights. First, that long-term research showed us that studies of children's ideas and young people's ideas of who can be a scientist showed us that that reflexive stereotype of a scientist as an older white man had been stubbornly hard to shift across decades and decades of long range research. And so children asked to draw a scientist seldom drew women or people of colour. And second, we knew that women were seriously underrepresented in senior leadership roles in STEM, in especially in visible leadership roles. And even with the enormous gains that we've made across the last decade, uh, women still represent about one in three members of the STEM workforce professionally in the research sector in our country and around one in four of the private sector workforce. And as a consequence, uh, women are underquoted as experts in STEM disciplines in our media, in those public visible conversations about who is an expert in STEM in our country. And so Science and Technology Australia set out to change that for the better. Thanks to the visionary leadership of many of you who have joined us today, the Superstars of STEM program was born. And I want to pay tribute to my predecessor, Kylie Walker, who made this happen and who's with us today. Thank you for joining us, Kylie, and for your legacy. I also want to acknowledge our valued partners in this project, the Federal Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, who were our foundation sponsors and have provided the backbone for this program. Uh, and our partners, of course, from the private sector who've been with us from the very get-go, and we really value their contribution. GE, Google, Brighter, STEM Matters, the Australian Science Media Centre and The Conversation. And among our many, many distinguished guests today, I welcome Ambassador for Women in STEM, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, who you'll be hearing from very shortly, Rani Yates from the department, Sam Maresh, who's the country leader for GE in Australia, Victoria's Chief Scientist, Dr Amanda Caples, Shirley Chowdhury from the Go Foundation, former STA President Ross Smith and our current President Jeremy Brownlee. Many superstars, many superstars alumna, uh, distinguished guests, one and all, and our fabulous young women who have joined us from Alfred Deacon High School with their teacher, Katarina Anderson, and you'll be hearing from them very shortly as well. And uh, when you do, you'll be as delighted as I am that the future of women in STEM looks like it's in pretty great shape in the hands of young women like this. And so far, this program has, of course, helped create 90 superstars of STEM, equipping them with skills and confidence to step into the media spotlight. And we've achieved so very much. More than 30 million eyeballs reached, more than 4,800 media mentions of unique news items generated by our superstars, 90,000 plus social media followers for their work. Seven in 10 of our superstars have experienced career progression during the time they've been with or after the program and more than 18,000 young people around our country have been reached with inspiring school visits, hearing from these brilliant mentors and visible role models of women in STEM. So we wanted to start by inviting uh, the Minister for Science, Industry and Technology, the Honourable Karen Andrews, who's a long time and, and very strong champion of women in STEM, to share with us a few words today about this program and to officially declare our search for the next constellation of superstars open. 
with women still underrepresented in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. It's so important that we have superstars of STEM who can get out there and talk to girls at school, women who are thinking of joining the workforce, perhaps in a different role, to inspire and encourage them to look at STEM and what the options are for them as, uh, as a career. When I was growing up and looking at what the options were for me, I was fortunate to have a sister who'd already started studying science and maths at school and went on to study agriculture and work in uh, agricultural science. So I had her to look up to and to inspire me. But it's really important that we have our superstars of STEM continuing to be out there to talk to people who are looking at, uh, at STEM. So if you are, a superstar of STEM already and you'd like to be part of the next round of the program for superstars of, of STEM, please put in a nomination. I encourage you to join a very, very worthwhile program and be part of inspiring future generations. And a, a very sincere thank you to the Minister for making time in her very busy schedule. Um, you will have noticed that the Department of Industry throughout the pandemic has also been on the front lines of trying to pivot the manufacturing and effort in this country to keep us safe. And we're really grateful for her time and, and that wonderful message today. Uh, Amongst the many, many superstars that we have generated from this program, we would love to interview them all and, and give you a taste of some of the terrific, exciting profile raising things they've done. But we've had to choose just a couple. And uh, one of those who joins us today is Dr. Kudzai Kanutu, who is uh, an infectious diseases specialist in Melbourne, working on the front lines of the COVID challenge there and has been uh, in the thick of things, uh, really trying to help with some of the testing and, and um, public explaining of how we're going to keep our, our country and communities as safe as they can be in these enormous time, trying, challenging, challenging times. And through this program, could say you've become a regular on ABC's The Drum in recent months and had a whole range of opportunities. Tell us a bit, bit about, if you will, the experience of being a superstar of STEM and what the training and, and skills program has helped you to do in your career and your public profile. Um, I think the, the first uh, impression is that it's been really transformative for me. Uh, so coming into it, I think we, myself and a lot of the other superstars were really in this um, mindset of feeling like, um, you know, you're always the one person, the one woman turning up. It's like being in a perpetual sort of um, fancy dress everywhere you go and feeling like, should I really be here? Am I, why am I always the only one? Um, and a lot of the process um, that what I learnt through the Superstars of STEM program is around really a significant mind shift, mindset shift. So going from a place of feeling like, should I really be here? Am I worthy of being here to one of, look, if I'm looking at a situation and I'm seeing that there aren't enough women in the room that we're not having adequate representation, that becomes a call to arms for you. That's actually a moment to gather your team, get your skates on and change that because you might actually have the opportunity to be first um, in a particular space or an environment. Uh, so allowing yourself that opportunity to uh, accept um, offers of help, accept offers of, you know, media presentation, uh, it actually requires you to be comfortable with silencing or coming to terms with your own sort of self-censorship. And I think a lot of us had that within us where we often self-censor, we actually stop ourselves from accepting opportunities because we feel like, well, I'm not the most noted professor in this particular field. Who am I to be speaking? And moving that to a voice of being, well, you have things that you can contribute. And as a scientist, as a, you know, a woman in STEM, you have a role to actually advocate and to be present and to share whatever it is that you have, even if you don't happen to be the foremost expert in your particular field, that you have the right. And in fact, it's a responsibility um, to be out there and to represent yourself. And for me, represent my community, um, to represent the, the people that I work with alongside, um, to be part of the, the whole STEM conversation. So, I mean, totally transformative for me um, to go from, you know, getting asked, oh, if you had asked me, uh, would you like to be on the drum two years ago? I would have been like, me, who, what? No, not me. I'll find someone who can do it though. To 
yeah, sure, that sounds great. And I know I may not be perfect that first time, but it's progress for me. And progress, I think, trumps perfection nine times out of 10. And that's, that's a real change for me personally. What an inspiring story. And thank you for your public and visible leadership, because it can be really challenging, I think, to step into that public and media spotlight for the first time. Um, and we're so proud of everything that you're doing. And we're so grateful for your work and those of your colleagues on the front lines of the COVID fight in Victoria right now. And we're thinking of you all. Another incredible success story out of this current cohort has been um, the impact that Kate Cole has managed to have. Uh, she's an engineer, occupational patient hygienist and a mask safety expert, which feels incredibly timely. Uh, this kind of expertise um, that we may not have always seen and valued is now right in the front of our thinking. And Kate, you managed to get yourself a bit of front page newspaper coverage in a couple of major newspaper outlets across the country in major capital cities. And as a consequence of that, you got regulators talking to you, you got a whole coalition of people. Tell us a bit more about what happened for you and, and the impact of, of that media coverage on the ability to drive forward your research and your expertise being embedded. Uh, well, thank you. I did get a lot of media coverage and the issue of fake N95 or P2 face masks in Australia has been happening since around March in Australia. And it was an issue that I knew was critically important, but I was really struggling as just one person to get the message out there. Um, I knew something had to happen fast because workers in industry, including healthcare workers, were at risk. So I actually worked with Bella at Superstars of STEM to pitch this story. And on the 26th of May, the news article of counterfeit face masks sold to Australian hospitals was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. And that resulted in our Federal Health Minister, Greg Hunt, ordering a national probe into counterfeit masks in hospitals that same day. That led to the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA, launching their post-market review of face masks, which has resulted in more than 280 face masks now being withdrawn from the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. And now they're no longer in our hospitals, which is fantastic news. But it's also resulted in a better understanding of the need for stricter checks on items like N95 or P2 face masks. It's led to a coalition of health and safety related organisations publishing a guide to help people understand how to purchase legitimate products. It's led to that coalition and the Australian Council of Trade Unions working together to call for the need for a national register of face masks. And it's led to collaboration with medical professionals to further advocate for appropriate respiratory protection and fit testing of masks, which was actually in the media late last week and today. And that's to ensure we have the right protections for healthcare workers. So having worked in this area of masks for a long time, uh, I can say that strong media interest in this area has resulted in better protections for workers at a pace far more rapidly than I ever could have achieved on my own. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful to the Superstars of STEM program and the fantastic media training that we received, because in the end, it's led to safer workplaces across Australia. And as an occupational hygienist, that is my ultimate goal. What incredible impact. Thank you for your work and um, for especially trying to keep our frontline health workers safe during this crisis. I think one of the things that's been really uh, heartbreaking is to see that level of personal risk and exposure that our health workers, our doctors, our nurses, our aged care workers step into every single day in the midst of this crisis. Uh, and your work to try and keep them as safe as they can be is an enormously important contribution. So thank you, Kate. We're really delighted today also to have been joined by the Australian Government's here, here, uh, the Australian Government's Ambassador for Women in STEM, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, who will be known to all of you on, uh, on this call today. Lisa is, of course, an astronomer, an author. Um, she's someone who's a bit of a rock star and managed to sell out, you know, large scale venues in her talks about astronomy uh, during a national tour a couple of years ago, which is incredible to achievement and is uh, a huge contributor on social media to really important conversations as well. In the last couple of years, Lisa's been in this really important structural role that the Australian Government created to drive greater impact on um, uh, achieving those gains for women and girls in STEM. And Lisa, 
your role is really setting out to try and draft, drive some long long term systemic change that that has some enduring capability to it. But I wondered if you could start by telling us a bit more about what that picture is that we're trying to shift and uh, some of the sort of statistical picture there, but also how you see programs like this and others contributing to that systemic shift uh, that we need to achieve here. Yeah, thanks, um, Misha. And, you know, the the first thing I noticed about this role as, as the Australian government's Women in STEM ambassador was that it's such a multifaceted problem, but one that we have defined really well. So, you know, the research picture um, is fortunately very clear um, and now we've got a plan going forward. So some of the stats you hear um, about 17% of STEM qualified uh, workforce in Australia is um, made up of women. Um, but if you sort of look at that more in a more granular way, um, you have certain areas where you know, engineering, for example, the figures um, are even less than 10%, uh, depending on how you slice and dice. So we're talking about 12% um, of the most senior academics um, in STEM are, are women. Um, and when you look at CEOs, it's only 14%. So you've got this... Um, you've got this kind of problem where a lot of young women now are going to university, um, a lot are studying um, science and technology, um, but most are in those bio and medical fields. And we still have this very, um, I guess, separated uh, gender, separated workforce. Um, so really reducing um, those segregations um, in, in the workforce according to gender, um, some of the, the main focus areas that we're trying to look at. Um, the reason why this is so, so important um, is this, it's kind of twofold, but it's really the same problem, is that, that women bring such brilliance, such knowledge um, and such discipline um, to everything that they do. Um, women make up 51% of the population in Australia, um, but with such an underrepresentation of women, and we're not getting the greatest minds doing the research, doing the technological development, um, and measuring and monitoring the social impacts of everything that we're doing with science and technology at the moment. Um, so that really means that the science and tech um, fields are not getting the best talent. Um, it also means that we're not rewarding merit and true merit, um, which is the creation of things that are good for our society. Uh, and on the other side of that is that women are losing out. So women's economic security um, is really impacted um, by the fact that the fastest growing op occupations are those that require STEM skills. They're growing um, one and a half times faster than other occupations. So it's going to get worse and worse. And if we don't address uh, the lack of women in STEM, uh, women's economic security is really going to suffer in Australia. And uh, you store up those long term problems, which are exacerbated by things like the gender pay gap. So my office, um, my responsibility, my position uh, was established really to help drive that systemic and cultural change. Um, so not providing band-aids, um, not providing, you know, small programs that are addressing um, very superficial issues, but really getting a whole suite of issues together and getting everyone involved from industry to government um, to university sector and research sector um, to the vet um, sector as well to really drive that cultural and systemic change that removes barriers to women um, working in STEM fields, retaining women in those fields and getting to senior levels. Um, so we do have a plan. Um, the Women in STEM Decadal Plan is fantastic. Um, it was really a, a, a real kind of community effort and there was a lot of consultation to create this 10-year plan for women in STEM. Um, so now we know what the problem is, we've elucidated that, we know what the barriers are and we know the sorts of ways we can help to address those systemic barriers. So we have a plan um, and that includes a lot of things, fixing workplace culture, um, removing systemic barriers in the workplace, um, discrimination, bias, sexual harassment, the lack of um, uh, equity in, in, in childcare, access to childcare and the, the types of work that people do at home um, on top of their, their paid work as well. Um, and then looking at younger people, um, we really have the challenge of attracting uh, young women to STEM um, because of those stereotypes and the types of um, in the, in the public eye and the media, 
uh, the types of um, people that we see traditionally uh, in the media talking about science are, as you say, old white men. Um, when we look at the school curricula across the country, many are stacked, if you look at the STEM curriculum, with those um, male uh, historical figures like you know, Einstein, Hawking, uh, Newton. You know, it's very, very culturally biased. It's very gender biased. And it doesn't tell the true story of science, technology and innovation, which is a very contemporary, modern and relevant story and one that you can excite young people with. So my office does a lot of work with teachers to try and really help them to create excitement about STEM and the contemporary nature and the relevance of STEM in our culture and in our society. Um, you know, that's why I write children's books as well, to get those role models, those female role models into the public eye. But this is where Superstars of STEM comes in and why it's so important. It's about that visibility angle. Um, and that was part of the Women in STEM Decadal Plan, the recommendations to make women more visible. So that's where Superstars comes in. So it's a pathway, as we've heard from previous participants, for women to get into the public eye, to, to hone their skills and get the opportunities um, and that real confidence piece to say, I belong here. Um, science and technology is about me. It's about everyone who works in science and technology and the stories uh, and the relevance to society and it's telling those stories that is the most powerful thing that people can do. And on a personal level, superstars of STEM, I've heard from my mentees and, and many other participants has given them real networks as well uh, and the ability to not only chase um, you know, public comment and to, to fill the space um, where they belong to and they deserve to be, but also to help them uh, engage in their careers and the um, push towards more senior levels uh, and that leadership angle, which is great. So I'm really, really happy to be here um, again at another launch uh, of Superstars of STEM. Um, and I'm just hoping that we get a torrent, a tsunami of wonderful um, applicants from all over the country, from every walk of life, um, so that we can keep telling these really important stories of our public health, of our environment, uh, climate change, um, of sending rockets to the moon, whatever it is, um, and that Australians can hear all these wonderful voices. Beautifully put. And thank you, Lisa, for your very visible public leadership for women in STEM also. It's a terrific uh, thing to watch you out there on that public stage so regularly, um, you know, through your work being that role model uh, for women in STEM, for young women in STEM especially, who might be thinking about STEM study on the way to STEM careers. And can I just endorse what Lisa's just said there. We need the help of everyone on this uh, launch conference today, getting the word out to as many brilliant, talented, diverse women as possible. So if you know a brilliant woman in STEM who you think is ready to step into that next level of uh, superstardom, please encourage them to apply actively and provide whatever support you can through your networks uh, to help put them uh, as, 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 you know, in the box seat uh, to apply this time around. We really, really need your help to do that. We're really excited today as well to be joined by some young women we hope might end up as superstars of STEM themselves uh, in the not too distant future, perhaps. And joining us today from Alfred Deacon High School in Canberra are Matilda, Harriet, Kira, Laurie, Zoe, Ali, Claire, Alexis, Jessica, Grace, Lily and Lottie and their executive teacher for science, Katarina Anderson, who's uh, at the school uh, and has been supporting them all to participate in STEM activities. And last summer, Matilda and Harriet, you went along to the Young Women in Engineering program, YAWI, which is run by one of our current superstars of STEM, Dr. Bianca Capra. Big shout out to you, who's here with us today as well. And so Matilda, firstly to you, can you tell us a bit about what sorts of things you did at that engineering summer camp and um, what sort of skills you acquired as a result? Um, yeah, we participated in um, many really interesting hands-on activities all based around engineering. Um, so we we disassembled and reassembled um, a lawnmower engine. We modeled what it's like to design a satellite. We learned about um, earthen dams um, and built like a model of one. And we, um, met, we learned about gas turbines and designed like rockets. Um, and, and we also got to hear from some really inspiring women in STEM 
careers um, or who were studying um, engineering, um, which was really fascinating. And I also learned a lot about how, how um, what kinds of different fields of engineering there are, which I really knew very little about before. So it was a really good experience. Terrific. We wondered whether Harriet, you might like also like to also jump in and perhaps tell us a little bit about for you as a young woman, what difference does it make to you to see inspiring women like the superstars of STEM being publicly visible role models for, for young women to stay in STEM subjects and to maybe choose STEM careers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I feel like uh, science and maths are often represented as a subject mainly for like men and boys and as a career as well. And I find that the superstars of STEM really like um, represents uh, like that so many different genders can be a part of that too. And also it's really amazing to see like so many different opportunities that there are for anyone that has a passion in that area. Terrific answer. Um, and just to the rest of the group, uh, keen to draw you in as well and to ask you one of the most amazing things about studying science, maths, engineering and technology is that it gives you incredible skills to make the world a better place, right? So if you're wanting to do anything with your future working lives from creating vaccines to preventing devastating bushfires to reviving our rivers and oceans to maths modelling with high-end supercomputing, these are the kinds of that are going to get you there. So I wondered if any of you want to jump in and tell us what's the most awe-inspiring thing you've learned in your STEM subjects so far at school. Um, well, I think that's something really interesting um, was learning about how um, it was like a lot of women who worked on the coding for getting to the moon. I thought that was really fascinating and so inspiring um, to know that it was women who worked on it. And a lot of these hidden stories, I love that. A lot of these hidden stories are ones we need to tell and retell uh, so that we make sure that that knowledge, that history is, is known to more people, right? Katarina, thank you so much for the work that you're doing to inspire these fabulous young women into STEM study. We're so grateful to you and all the teachers around the country and careers counsellors who put young women on the path into STEM. It's such an exciting set of things to do with your career and study. So thank you all for being with us today. I'm now going to hand over to our president, Jeremy Brownlee, to formally wrap up and say a few thank yous. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks to everyone online today who have helped to bring the Superstars of STEM program into being and for making it the huge success that it is today. I'd especially like to thank the Minister, Karen Andrews, for her strong personal support for women in STEM and of this program to advance women in STEM. Special thanks also to Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith for the tireless work that you do every day to champion the cause and to help raise the profile of women in STEM. The Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources for its strong support of the program. Uh, I'd also like to thank our program partners who have been with us since the beginning. So GE, Google, Brighter, STEM Matters, the Australian Science Media Centre and The Conversation. Thank you all for the support. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank all of our current and past superstars. There's a number of you joining us today. Uh, it's been amazing to see you all share your stories and shine so brightly uh, out there and inspiring the next generation of researchers, but also the current researchers as well. And of course, our high powered government industry and university mentors for the program, many of whom are with us today as well. So thank you all for your time and deep commitment to this program. I'd also like to thank our brilliant staff at, at Science and Technology Australia, led by our CEO, Misha Schubert, and our new Superstars of STEM program manager, Dr. Sandra Gardam, as well as the whole team, including Shannon Wong, Georgie Oven, Bella Cunahan, Kat B. Hag, Zoya Patel, who's new today, so welcome, Zoya, uh, Kyle McCann, Mitch Piercy, and Peter Dobashier, who have all helped prepare for this new round of applications. I'd also like to thank our former CEO, Ms. Kylie Walker, who's here with us uh, today. It was Kylie who conceived of this idea a few years ago and what a remarkable idea uh, it has been and a, a true legacy for, for Kylie. So thanks for joining us today, Kylie. And thank you all. Um, you know, please help us spread the word to as many brilliant applicants as you can. As we've heard today from both Lisa and from Michelle, 
this program really does depend upon a strong diversity of applicants. So it's, it's the strength of this program. And so I'd encourage all of you to use your networks to encourage women of all backgrounds uh, to apply. So thank you and farewell. <laughs>